I very often start when I talk about this subject with this picture, which is a, a touch point for me, a, literally a, a touch point for me. And this is a, a picture of a slice through an ice core. And this is an ice core which has been drilled from the polar um, ice cap in the Antarctic region in the South Pole. And uh, scientists, climate scientists, have, have researched by drilling more than 3,000 meters down to rock at the, uh, the South Pole area uh, and pulling up these uh, ice cores, which have within them, as you can see, bubbles of air, and those bubbles of air have been trapped under layers of snow and ice year after year after year, and so they can go back several hundred thousand years to the deepest ice cores. And that is why we know when you, I've actually had the privilege of holding one of these um, slices and you put it up to your ear, you can hear it go pop, 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 and it's all the bubbles bursting, and it's, that's how we know that something discontinuous has happened in our uh, climate in our atmosphere because there's been a regular cycle every hundred thousand years or so of increase in CO2, there's been ice ages and there's been changes and rewarming of the of the planet but what we know is what's happened in the last uh, 100 years, 150 years since the Industrial Revolution is there's been a huge acceleration in the content of CO2, carbon dioxide in our environment. So I've met many people with a, a skeptical view of the uh, explanations for climate change and how man-made it is and how, you know, what's really caused it. But what you cannot dispute are the facts, the evidence that actually lies behind the phenomena that we're seeing. And this is really why we're here talking about uh, sustainable technology and sustainable fuels in particular. And what we know is that uh, in order to affect this stabilization, we need to concentrate on uh, the emissions from transport itself. There are many sectors of, of uh, CO2 emission, but we need to uh, recognize that even by 2050, we will need to be fundamentally operating uh, our transport sector with low carbon fuel um, already by then if we're going to avoid this continuing increase. When we look at that India's situation, it's a a developing country, it's an emerging uh, economy, and we know that that population growth and economic development will result in, in uh, a growth in emissions, and that actually because of that, and because of the number of people and the, and the activity that's there, that the future growth of CO2 emissions will come largely from uh, emerging countries, and that's why we probably have a very important role to play here in terms of the choices we make to enable uh, economic development to continue, to enable poverty to be reduced and so forth, but at the same time to be responsible in terms of the technologies that we deploy and, uh, and how we um, can avoid this turning into a, an unmanageable situation will equalize. And part of our challenge is how do we innovate, how do we um, support this process but avoid this uh, and keep the gradient of this uh, curve as low as possible. We see that uh, primary energy use in India will uh, more than double over the next 25 years. And that actually the growth in the share of oil consumption that will be represented by transport will also grow. So therefore it's, it's very relevant for us to, to focus uh, on this particular problem. There's another aspect which is uh, one that often has to be pointed out to, to visitors to India which is to do with the relative price of fuel and the, uh, the relative pricing uh, that we find within uh, our country here. And this is a, an attempt using the, um, the patented Starbucks coffee index, which is uh, the number of cups of coffee which represent a gallon of gasoline in a particular country. So what you see is that actually relative to people's affordability in India is that actually gasoline is hugely expensive. And this is another factor which we need to, uh, to think about because 
when we think about the cost of abatement in uh, CO2 emission, we have to take into account that the affordability of the vehicle itself, if we talk about passenger cars, 80% of our passenger cars uh, are less than $10,000, actually, which is about the lowest price you can even buy a vehicle in, in Europe, for example, or in the United States. And therefore, we can't just simply plow money into this. We also have to be uh, very aware of the operational running costs. So we cannot inflate the, uh, the cost of, of running the vehicle because that will equally have a damaging effect on the other economic forces in the development of, the, uh, of society here in, in India. So the economics around uh, greenhouse gas abatement is very different in our market and in our uh, region than it is, for example, in, uh, in the European or the, the US. So in transportation, there are three fundamental um, pillars that we're working on to, to work with greenhouse gas emissions. The first is, of course, to look at energy efficiency, to look at the efficiency of the, of the driveline, the way that energy is consumed on the vehicle. Um, we see a lot of hybrids. Toyota probably were the, were the uh, pioneers of that. Uh, but now what we call XEVs, all the, the range of different options from a micro-hybrid to a mild hybrid to a plug-in hybrid to a full electric vehicle. Uh, we see those now uh, being made available, but we see very low take-up of them, even in the developed countries. And this is because of significant costs associated with these uh, technologies. We see lighter vehicles and uh, use of now more advanced materials, whether it be advanced boron steels and different uh, grades of, of uh, steel or aluminium, as we see at JLR, for example, uh, where they're really leaders in the uh, development of aluminium bodies, or uh, indeed in composites and, uh, and use of new materials, and even down to the application of nanotechnology and other, other new innovations that enable lighter weight uh, vehicles to be there, <coughs> reduction of parasitic losses, and there's still a lot of optimization that we can do on our, uh, uh, on our existing conventional um, systems, internal combustion engine and transmission systems. The second thing is all to do with actually how we use the vehicles. And here we would say uh, the emergence of intelligent traffic management and of connectivity between the car and uh, other cars the car and the infrastructure itself, or indeed in car sharing and the, and the uh, sort of mobility models that we're uh, starting to see. We've recently, um, I was in uh, Vancouver, and uh, there they have Car2Go, which is a smart car, a small two-seater uh, smart car, which you access with a credit card, with a, a type uh, key that you've got, and you can then pick up the car and use it to go where you're going close it off again and leave it. And so it's really optimized to, uh, to source people who need to use a vehicle, but just one direction, not two directions, and only for the period which is, is needed. And an app, a simple app on the phone, shows you where the cars are and, and how that goes ahead. So there's no question, if, also if we look into our uh, fleet man at Tata Motors, we have a, a telematic system, fleet man, which is uh, tracking uh, our commercial vehicles enabling our customers to track fuel economy and, and condition of the vehicle, but also allowing them to see where the vehicles are, to plan their routes, and uh, make sure that their routes are efficiently planned, and also look at the utilization of the, of, the, uh, of the truck. So is it full in both directions, or is it empty in one direction and coming out? So these are all things which are to do with looking at the use of vehicles. Finally, and really the focus of what I'm talking about this evening is to do with uh, carbon intensity of fuel and actually the fuels themselves. And here, really, I want to talk about uh, a different take on, uh, on this compared to uh, some of the things in the other two pillars, because we want to talk about how we can look at the whole uh, well-to-wheel or synthesis-to-consumption cycle of the fuel and how we can think about how to, to bring that in and drop it into the existing technology that we have to avoid the increases in cost associated with electric drive, but to be carbon neutral in terms of the acquisition. That's something I want to really talk about over the next few minutes. And this is the grand challenge which we have um, given ourselves 
is to say, is there a fuel that can be produced sustainably at viable cost and at the volumes required to replace hydrocarbon fuels? so that we can use it in internal combustion engines, which we already have. We can apply it to the legacy fleet, the existing part that we have in the, uh, in the uh, market, without huge modification, and would actually meet the emission requirements in terms of toxic emissions, but also be neutral in terms of the, uh, the whole cycle. And that is what has led us to really to focus on what options are available, and uh, and to really which are the candidate technologies to uh, to take that forward, because replacing gasoline and diesel is a difficult job. Gasoline and diesel are, are very nice fuels. They they have high uh, energy density. They uh, are easy to handle. They have high volumetric efficiency also, so they don't take up a lot of space on the uh, on the vehicle, and they have many characteristics which are uh, favorable in terms of, and which we've mastered over the last hundred years or so, in terms of uh, the way that we can use them. So they're a tough act to follow in terms of finding an alternative or a substitute that fits into that same um, set of properties. And so what we want to do is really, considering these things, we need to develop something which will fit into the existing applications that we have rather than work out something which needs a complete different uh, application. Our approach to this has been, I think, uh, quite innovative in a, in, a, in a way. We got together with, um, with Terry in Delhi, the, uh, the, instant, the energy and resource infinite uh, resource. So what we um, really took, and that is a, it's a fundamental principle of the work that's going on, is that actually solar uh, and phot photovoltaic processes have far greater efficiency overall than generating biofuels, even though they, biofuels have some tactical benefit. Actually, the, the long-term answer lies more in how we can harness um, solar to, uh, to create fuels in the future. And the processes that uh, we take, the chemistries that uh, are there, you can see on this uh, chart is really comparing the different efficiency levels that uh, exist. And this may not seem that significant, although the solar shows at uh, around twice the potential efficiency, but it actually is hugely significant because when you actually see the, uh, the amount of investment in terms of, of space or land area or uh, infrastructure that's needed, even one percentage point of movement in terms of this uh, efficiency quotient is, is fundamental in terms of the practicality of, of rolling some of these technologies out. And so what we uh, really wanted to, to focus on was this top one, which is uh, solar and thermochemical extraction of CO2 and how we can use that to synthesize uh, new fuels to use in future. Because this dream that we had, um, when we started this process, we, we wanted to establish whether it really was a dream or whether it was something which is reachable. And, and what we found in the previous slide is that there are processes that match the sort of efficiencies that are needed. We then thought about how much land would be needed to be dedicated to uh, these processes if we were going to be able to generate that would be there. So in 2008, to cover the uh, demand for fuel, you'd need around 2% of the land mass. If you multiply and project forward the growth in the market in terms of, uh, of passenger vehicles and trucks and go forward uh, 25 years or so, then you would actually need an impractical amount of, of land mass. But if the efficiency improves, then you see that it actually comes right down to being uh, a thinkable way ahead. So as we start to touch 5%, 6% efficiencies, then it starts to become possible and practical. In um, Brazil, of course, they already do that. They have a huge uh, landmass to do that. There are technologies available that are mapped out here that move from solar to using the electrolysis, driving the electrolysis plants, which allow us to uh, create hydrogen and which allow us then to capture CO2 from emitters and turn it into synthesized hydrocarbon fuel, which then gets burnt. But in that whole cycle, 
it returns the CO2 to the environment and it's then, it's then neutral. If we look at the, the landscape of fuels, therefore, that are available, we have some problems with some of the, uh, the solutions. If we look at hydrogen, there's a huge infrastructure ha challenge of handling hydrogen. And it's anyway difficult to package for range and for uh, to integrate into the vehicle. If we look at CNG, we're already using CNG, but we are net importers of CNG in India. We have about, in the, over the next 20 years or so, only about 10% of the energy requirements could be satisfied by CNG. So it's not really a, a long-term solution. And this green circle starts to point out some interesting solutions in terms of ethanol, in terms of dimethyl ether, and in terms of uh, eth um, ethanol itself. And actually, one of the, uh, I want to just dwell on one example of methanol, which really came out, which is, is to show how we can actually use um, methanol to offer a substantial emission reduction compared to gasoline. It can be compatible with internal combustion engines. It can be used directly in fuel cells. And if we look at dimethyl ether, then this is already a high cetane substitute for diesel. And we are seeing already in the US some trials associated with, uh, with diesel. So, so this seems to be, at the moment, a very strong candidate to be the substitute for conventional gasoline or conventional diesel applications that starts to tick some of the boxes of being compatible with our existing applications. It happens that, as with a number of other things, if we look at the pickup of this technology, the scale up of this is already happening in China. And we started, this is a map uh, of uh, China, and the M M15 means 15% methanol, M30 means 30% methanol. So you're already starting to see pilot programs and availability and, and usage of uh, methanol technology to, uh, to meet this uh, demand. And this scaling up will have an impact on the development of the technology itself, but it will also have an impact on plant prices, and it will also help us roll out, therefore, uh, cost-effectively as they, as they uh, develop the maturity of this technology. So in order to fulfill that, we'll need to climb this st stairs in terms of, of having uh, identified the, engineer, the, the source of, of uh, the energy in terms of having conversion processes which are manageable and, uh, and cost-effective. I've talked about some of the infrastructure implications in terms of, of how we can integrate that into our uh, existing applications. Storage. So what I've tried to do in a, in a few minutes is to, uh, to really give you an understanding of the context of why we're looking in this direction to satisfy our dream of having uh, sustainable fuel that will be greenhouse gas neutral from production through combustion and consumption into, um, into the atmosphere to allow us to find a very low cost and effective way of rolling out and reducing our emissions over the next 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.